Welcome everyone to Resurrection Sunday. So glad you're here. This is uh, such an exciting time of year for us. It's uh, the, the day we celebrate when everything changed. And so uh, I'm, I'm so thankful that you came out. Welcome. We're so glad to have you. If you have your Bible with you, go to John chapter 19. If you don't have a Bible with you, you can just use your phone, download a free Bible app and go to John 19. Or if you don't want to take up space on your phone, just type John 19 into an internet search and you'll find it right away. We're going to be mostly in John 19 and 20 this morning. So how many of you know that Living Hope is a Bible church? Can I get an amen? All right. So Living Hope is a Bible church, which means that uh, we do our absolute best to derive all of our b Christian beliefs directly from Scripture. That's what, that's what we mean when we say Bible church. It means that we're trying to understand what the book says and then believe like it tells us to believe and live like it tells us to live. Now, that means that sometimes what we believe may, may uh, be different than traditional Christianity. That's what that means because we're not afraid to change. We have changed. I've changed. We've, we've all changed in this room, many of our beliefs over the years. And you know what? That's okay. That's okay. There's nothing to be afraid of there. Think about Jesus for a moment. Was Jesus accepted by the traditional religious people of his time? Who, who, was the, who were the ones that gave Jesus the most trouble? It was the scribes. What is a scribe? Somebody who writes out scripture. You think they knew what the book said? Yeah, they're Bible people, the scribes. And the Pharisees, people who dedicated their whole lives to trying to understand and live it out, those are the ones that gave Jesus a hard time, the mainliners of his time. And Jesus says in one place that a disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for the disciple to be like his teacher and a servant like his master. If they called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more were they malign? those of his household. So look, if, you, if you're accepted by everybody in Christianity, you might want to check yourself. <laughs> because Jesus says, you're not better than me. Amen. It's enough for you to be like him. But we're not better than Jesus, right? So, but I hate being deceived. Don't you hate being deceived? It's just the worst. You think, you think something is, is, is one way and then you find out it's, it's another way. I just... It just happened to me about a month ago. I, was, uh, I have a podcast called Restitutio, and I put out an episode on hell. Nice cherry topic. Usually John Courtright teaches hell here at Living Hope. <laughs> He's kind of got a corner on the market there. But uh, you know, on my podcast, I'm allowed to, to do whatever I want. So I, I did an episode <laughs> in hell. And uh, somebody came on, and they challenged me. They gave me six points of why I was wrong about something I said. It was kind of a minor issue. Uh, and I was just like, Wow. I don't like this being challenged, <laughs> but I thought about it, and I didn't have any evidence on my side, just hearsay. I heard this person say it, heard that person say it, heard this other person say it. I asked John. He said, well, yeah, this Bible dictionary says, says it, but they say it's supposed. I'm like, ooh, that doesn't sound good. You know, when the authorities use the word it's supposed to be this way, uh, as it's supposed to be. And you know what? I was, I was faced with a, ch a choice, and I had to either change or stick to what I believed in the absence of all evidence to the contrary. So I changed. You know, and it wasn't comfortable. But you know, there's something about when you, when you change your beliefs because you see something clear in Scripture that you haven't seen before, that's exciting, right? And I bring all this up because we're going to be talking about life and death and the afterlife and resurrection. And I realize that a lot of Christians believe differently on this very subject. And so I challenge you this morning to just read scripture for what it says. And really, I want to share with you two things this morning. One, that Jesus is worthy of your heart. And two, that his resurrection is, is, is what set the standard. So Jesus is worthy of your heart, and his resurrection set the standard. And I, I think we're going to see that in John 19 and 20 uh, this morning. So before I forget, come back next week because John Courtright is going to share part two about the resurrection and we're going to get some Hebrew flavor from the prophets and the Psalms and from the Old Testament about resurrection. So please come back next week. All right, John chapter 19, verse 38 is where I'd like to begin, which reads, After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly 
for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Verse 39. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been lain. So, he be so because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Now, I want to mention to you about the Jewish burial practice, because it's, it's not the same as ours. First, of course, they wash the body, which is pretty much standard in all cultures. But then the Jews would anoint the body with very strong smelling spices. Then they would put the body in a tomb. And, well, no, they would wrap the body. So they anoint it and then wrap it in a, 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 gar a burial clothes of some sort. In this case, it was a, a linen cloth. And they would lay the body in a tomb. Okay, that doesn't sound all that strange. I mean, maybe it's a little different because their tombs aren't, you know, underground. They're more like caves in the area around Jerusalem during the time of Jesus. But this is where it gets interesting. Then they'd wait a year and they'd come back and they'd unwrap the body. And after a year, all of the flesh would be desiccated and what would be left would be the bones. And they would take those bones, they would collect them, and they would put them in ossuaries, bone boxes, which were very cheap around the time of Christ because of all the renovations on the temple, lime was in great supply. So we have all these lime bone boxes, and, and it needs, it's not that big, it just needs to be big enough for your skull and your femur and you know, your bones to fit in it. And then they would put that bone box with other bone boxes. These are pictures I took last October when I was in Jerusalem. And uh, they have these on display in, in certain places. And uh, there would be a family tomb. And they would scratch your name on the side sometimes, sometimes not, because it's like, all right, we know who, who's who. And uh, they would do it like that. The Jews really believed that God would turn those dry bones into living people. That's, that's, the, that's what's behind all this care for the bones and, and, and making sure everything is taken care of. That and uh, real estate was really expensive. So you want to fit a bunch into one, <laughs> one tomb. And so they really believed that God would make those dry bones into living people. Even to this day, tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands, I don't even think anybody's sure, of Jews are buried on the Mount of Olives. This is another shot I took on the Mount of Olives. Mount of Olives is just a hill opposite Jerusalem. And what's so interesting about this, and this burial custom is a little newer, it's about 500 years or so old that they've been doing this, so, uh, as far as I know, is that they bury them feet facing Jerusalem. Feet facing Jerusalem. So that when they arise in the resurrection, they are looking at the city and the Messiah going into the city. Here's another shot of that. Uh, so I think when we read Scripture, we have to be careful not to assume that, oh, yeah, they buried Jesus. We know what that means. Do we? It's, it's different than what we think it means. Uh, and so there, there is really a lot going on here. But let's go back to the, the gospel, or gospel of John, chapter 20. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one who Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Look, this is not good news. This is bad news. We think of it as good news. Hey, empty tomb. He's risen. That's not where she's at right now. She's like, the body's missing. We have a problem, guys. She's going back and she's reporting. But who is, who is Mary Magdalene? I want to just, uh, I have some scriptures on the screen here I want to show you about Mary. Uh, Mary Magdalene is mentioned in Mark 15, 37 to 40, where it says, And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last. This is when, at the crucifixion. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. And, the, and there were also women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, the younger and of Joseph and Salome. So Mary Magdalene was at the crucifixion. She was there when he breathed his last. She was standing there when Jesus died. Mark 15, 46 says, And Joseph 
bought a linen shroud and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of the rock and he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph saw where he was laid. That's how she knew how to come back to the, that's how, she know where to, how she knew where to go is that she was there when Joseph uh, was, was burying him. But the question is like, why in the world is this woman, Mary Magdalene, at the crucifixion of Christ, and why is she tagging along to see the burial location? And then why is she coming back? I mean, why is she so interested in Jesus? Well, we don't really know much about Mary Magdalene, contra all the rumors and myths and traditions and the Da Vinci Code and everything else that people say about Mary Magdalene. Historically speaking, we know very little. And I'm going to give to you what we know. It's from Luke chapter 8. I have it here on the screen. It says in verse 1, Soon afterwards, Jesus went on through cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him. And also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's household manager, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their means. So who is Mary Magdalene? Well, thankfully, I have a picture of her here so that uh, you can. I have no idea if Mary Magdalene was older than Jesus or younger than Jesus or tall or short or anything else, but uh, thankfully, Google knows. So uh, we, we, we've got her picture right here. Uh, so who, who was Mary Magdalene? She was there as a disciple. She traveled with Jesus and the Twelve. She was with these other women who took care of Jesus. They took care of him financially, and they uh, took care of him in other ways, and the other disciples. And she was there right up until the end. Mary was not a weak follower like most of his male disciples. Sad to say, guys. But we were hiding when he was being crucified, except for the one whom he, whom he loved. But Mary Magdalene was there through it all. And she really believed in Jesus. She had left everything, just like the, the Twelve had left everything. She and these other ladies, they had left everything, and, and they're following Jesus on the road. She saw it all happen, and uh, she risked it all. But she's not done yet. She's not done yet. She knows that Jesus has died. You know, I'm sure that broke her heart in a million ways. Uh, but she needs to make sure that Jesus' body is taken care of. She's concerned that his body is not taken care of, and so are the women. You know, they're, they're, they don't know that Joseph and Nicodemus did a good enough job, so they're, they're, they're going to go now that the Sabbath is over. Now they're going to go and they're going to see and make sure that Jesus' body is taken care of. And she gets there and Jesus is gone. So she's upset. She goes and she tells Peter and the other disciple, and she doesn't say, he's raised from the dead. No, what does she say in verse 2? She says, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb. And we do not know where they have laid him. She's distraught. After everything has happened, just imagine what this woman's been through, being there for the crucifixion, being there for the uh, burial, or at least you know, seeing where the location was. Now he's gone. It's like tearing off a scab and your heart bleeding all over again. Now he's gone. So she goes to Peter for help. Help, Peter, where is he? Look at verse uh, 2. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Verse 3, So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together. Look, this is an emergency. They're running. There's more running in these two verses than in the rest of the Gospel of John combined. Both of them were running together, and the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen clothes lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen clothes lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen clothes, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead." Then the disciples went back to their homes. So you get the picture here, right? Mary, she runs, she gets Peter. Peter, he's gone. Help. So Peter, he notices the seriousness of the situation. The other disciple, uh, probably John, but you know, there's some debate about that. They both start running. Everybody's running. 
right? They run, and, and John gets there, and he, and, and, he get, and he stops right at the edge of the tomb, and he looks in there, and he sees this strange sight. There's the linen cloth, what we call the shroud, and it's, it's there like a deflated balloon. It's, there's nothing in it. It's just there, laying there. Now, look, that's weird. Now, if the tomb is, if the tomb is empty, you, you can put together a theory. If there's nothing in there, you say, oh, okay, somebody took him away. But who would unwrap him? <laughs> who in the world would unwrap him and take the naked, dead Jesus? Nobody would do that. And so then Peter, you know, he's running and he comes and he doesn't stop with John. He runs right back into the tomb and uh, he makes a new discovery, right? He sees that there's the face cloth is set on a different part to the side and it's folded up. Now, what grave robber <laughs> unwraps a body and then takes the face cloth off and then neatly folds it up on the side? It's just weird. So they're, they're, both, they're both thinking, what's going on here? And I, I'm not really sure. It says the other disciple believed, and then in the next verse it says, but they didn't understand that the scripture that he was raised from the dead. You know, I'm not really sure how to make that all together. But needless to say, they don't really know what to do. There's not really much to do. So they go home. That's what you do when there's nothing to do, right? So they just, they go home. And then we get to the, uh, the part in verse... 10 there. Uh, let me just read this again. And then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And she wept. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. Now, Mary must have been utterly bewildered at this point. She went to get help. They weren't any help. You know, they, they checked out the scene. Then they left and they went home. And she's there and she's, she's weeping. I mean, this woman has been crying for days. You know, that uh, horrible feeling you get in, like a pit in your stomach when you're, when you're grieving over a loved one. And, and there's all this sense of injustice over it with Jesus where he never did anything wrong. We've all at least done something wrong. And, she, and she's weeping and, and through her tears she, she looks in and she sees the angels. She sees these angels. Um, they had beaten Jesus. They had mocked him. They had crucified him. When they were crucifying Jesus, you know what they did? They mocked him some more. They said, oh, if you're really the Messiah, why don't you come off that cross? Mary Magdalene was there for the whole thing, and now his body's gone, and she's completely devastated. Verse 13, they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. That's her issue. That's her problem. That's her mission. She wants to know where her dead Lord is so she can take care of him. Um, so she thinks she has, you know, some, maybe they have some information they can give her. There's no mention here that, she's, that she realizes she's talking to angels. I mean, you ever been so grieved, so out of it, that you just have no idea who you're even talking to? I, that, maybe that's what's going on here. I, I don't know. But usually when angels show up, people are like, ah! And what is the first thing the angel says? Yeah. Don't be afraid. There's none of that with Mary. She's just like, where did they put him? She's like a dog on a bone with this issue. Look at verse 14. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? I guess that's the question to ask, right? They keep saying, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. She's going to do it on her own. Don't you love this woman? She doesn't need permission. She's not going to go talk to Pilate and be like, well, somebody move the Lord, and I would like an official decree to put him back. And She's not going to get anybody else involved. She says, look, Gardner, you took him. You took him. Look, I'm not going to say anything. You just tell me where he is. And she's going to go get him, and she's going to bring him back. He may be naked. You know, the, the rap is right there. So it's a good chance that he's naked. He's, he's decomposing. You know, this is three days later, right? He's, uh, she doesn't care. 
She doesn't care. She's going to go get him, and she's going to bring him back, and she's going to give him an honorable burial because that's what she's going to do because she's taking care of him. Then the impossible happens. Look at verse 16. This is just the whole reason why we're here this morning, this verse right here. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And that he had said these things to her. Isn't that something? He says her name, and that's his reveal. He doesn't say, I'm Jesus. He says her name. He says, Mary. That's his reveal. And she blurts out, Rabboni, which means my rabbi, my teacher. And then she grabs him. How do we know she grabbed him? He says, stop clinging to me. <laughs> I bet she squeezed him tight. I bet she squeezed him real tight. And then, and then she's off. And then she's off. She's running. She's running. She's like, all right. She's running. I'm going back. I'm going back to those disciples. Peter, Peter, he's alive. John, he's alive. And then, and then he, he, she comes to Mary, the mother of Jesus, and she says to her, he's alive. He's alive. Can you imagine the joy in Mary Magdalene's heart as she runs around and she says, he's alive. And I love her line. I've seen the Lord. She says it over and over. I've seen the Lord. She says it to Joanna. She says it to Susanna. And then they all go and they, and they say to, to, to Peter, and this is, the, this is the response, Luke 24, 10. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with whom with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. <laughs> guys. <laughs> guys, we're not looking too good here. Seriously. I mean, yeah, like Peter's like the male proxy. He's like the alpha male. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't stop like the other disciple. He runs into the tomb and he's looking around, he's like, uh, laws about cleanliness be damned. You know, I don't care if I touch a dead body. I don't care if I'm defiled for the Feast of Unleavened Bread. I'm going in. That's Peter, right? But when the good news comes from the mouth of Mary Magdalene, Peter's like, woman, you're crazy. <laughs> right? That's what they think. But these other women, they believe. Joanna. And Mary, the mother of James, and the other women. There's, there's lots of other women here that believe. And uh, so this is, this is an important point. I, I want to I just focus on this for a minute here. Because Mary Magdalene's got this in her belly. You cannot shut this woman up. She just, she just saw Jesus. She knows he's alive. And you know what he said to her? He said to her, I have not yet ascended to my father, but go and tell them that I will ascend to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And so here's, here's what's so interesting about it. In their culture, in, that, in antiquity, it's a male-dominated world. Uh, women weren't trusted very high, or they weren't honored very highly. They, they, were low status, they were lower status than men. And uh, so there's this interesting anti-Christian named Kelsis who wrote a book against Christianity in the year... 170 something, 177 I think, and uh, one of his main points that he makes in this book about how there's no way Jesus was raised from the dead is that, and this is a direct quote, that it was on the basis of a, a half frantic woman. <laughs> on the basis of a half frantic woman. You guys built this whole religion on the basis of a half frantic frantic woman. That's what, against, check it out yourself, against Kelsis chapter 59. That's his argument against Christianity. If, now look, if you were making this up, if you were making this up, who are you going to put at the tomb, the empty tomb, to see Jesus? Oh, Peter, come on. Peter's the first pope for goodness. No, I'm just kidding. But Peter's, Peter's a big shot. I don't think he was a pope, for the record. 
But he was a big shot. You would put Peter there. You would put John there. You would put James there. You put one of these, or Joseph of Arimathea. He's a good guy, right? He, he's the one that had the guts to go to Pilate and ask for the body. You would have put a half frantic woman there if you were making it up because that would have been embarrassing. But that's not who Jesus picked. Jesus, in that context, in that situation where women are treated as having lower status than men, Jesus picked Mary. He could have walked along. She didn't know it was him. He could have walked along. He picked her. Jesus picked Mary. She was the first. She had the extraordinary honor, the first to see the resurrected Jesus. Don't you just love that? <laughs> Jesus doesn't care if you're a low-status person. And he doesn't care if you're a high-status person. When Jesus calls his disciples to him, there's a big crowd out in front of him. Jesus says, if anyone would like to come and follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Whether you're tall or short, rich or poor, educated or uneducated, if anyone would like to follow Jesus, he just says, look, you just got to deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Whether you're uh, old or young, whether you're damaged goods, whether you have history or baggage or whatever your sins, whatever you've done, you're welcome with Jesus. The invitation goes out to you, whether you're gay or straight, whether you're or not sure, whether you're male or female or not sure. You're welcome. You're invited to come to Jesus. You're welcome to come to Jesus and to deny yourself Take up your cross and follow him. He does not discriminate on the basis of anything other than your desire. That's what he discriminates on the basis of. You want him? He says, come. He says, come. Who was Mary Magdalene? Well, from, from what, we, what we could gather, she probably didn't have a college degree. She probably wasn't part of the Pharisees. You know why? That was a boys' club. She probably didn't even come from a great family, or else that would have been mentioned, just like it was in the case of the other ladies there. You know who she was? Who was Mary Magdalene? She was a woman with seven demons. That's her qualification. That's all we know about her. She had seven demons. She, she's, she's, one of the, she's more like one of these people that's half naked, smelly, muttering to themselves, hearing voices. That's more the Mary Magdalene than any other category in our society today. And that's the one Jesus picked. He healed her, and then in the end, he showed up to her. That's the one he picked for the most important announcement in all human history. I just love that. Don't you just love that? I just love that. Because that means that you have a chance. That means that I have a chance. Because you know what? I only had six demons. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Mary Magdalene is, is the one that he picked, so he could pick you too. It's all based on your desire. Jesus says, come to me. That's what Jesus says. He says that then, he says it now. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Is your soul troubled? Come to Jesus. He is worthy of your heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Come to Jesus. He's worthy of your heart. He'll show you the way. Rest in Him. He's not dead. He's alive. Right? But once you come to Him, you've got to change. Once you come to Jesus, I mean, it doesn't matter what condition. It doesn't matter if you're on death row and you've got five minutes left until they pssst, hit you with the needle. You can still come to Jesus, right? But once you come to Jesus, you got to change. Because once you invite him in, that's exactly what he starts doing. He takes that old heart of yours, just like an old house, and he starts working on it. And you know what? He doesn't stop. He keeps working on it and keeps working on it, and he will renovate your soul. And in time, you won't even recognize yourself. That's the Jesus we follow. That's the Son of God for you. 
And this concludes my first point. Jesus is worthy of your heart. Now to my second point, his resurrection sets the standard. His resurrection sets the standard. Let's uh, think for a moment about the afterlife. But uh, I would like you to go to Luke chapter 24. So if you could flip over to Luke 24 while I uh, talk about the afterlife for a moment. There's a lot of beliefs out there about the afterlife, about what happens when you die, about the ultimate reward for the good people and the bad people. The Egyptians said that they, you go to the kingdom of the dead and uh, that your soul goes there. And if you're worthy, you can accompany the sun on his ride across the sky every day. That sounds nice. The Greeks believed in an uh, elaborate mythology where you go, your soul goes to the river Styx and it's escorted by a ferryman. And you can go to a range of places. They have Elysium, which is paradise, and then a few others in between. And then at the bottom, you have Tartarus, where there's like lava torture. And then you have the Norse mythology, right? And their belief was that cremation released your soul from your body and that for the best of the souls, they could go to Valhalla, uh, which, of course, is in all the Thor movies, right? Valhalla is where you would go, and uh, every day is a great battle, and everybody kills everybody else, and then whoever's left gets to, to feast with Odin. And then the next day, they come back to life, and they do it again. Sweet paradise, if you're, if you're, if you're a Viking, I suppose. And then uh, the Norse also believe in a place called Nithhel, uh, where you suffer and you're tormented. Then you have the Buddhist belief about the afterlife. They believe in rebirth based on karma. You do good things, you have a good rebirth. Uh, the best scenario for a Buddhist, the best scenario is that you would escape the cycle of, of birth and rebirth, birth, death, rebirth, and that you would cease to exist. That's the ultimate goal. <laughs> that doesn't appeal to you, John. You, you're, you don't, you're not ready to sign up. I can't sit like that, so I know I was excluded. You know, my, my knees aren't that flexible. I love chairs, personally. And then you have the Hindus. The Hindus have the best artwork, by the way, in my opinion. Very colorful. Um, and the, so they believe in reincarnation based on karma as well, but they believe the ultimate goal is to reach what? Nirvana, right? The ultimate goal is to reach disembodied bliss. Um, and then you have most Christians. Most Christians believe that good people go to heaven when they die and uh, that bad people go to hell. In heaven, you're reunited with loved ones. In hell, you're tormented day and night, forever and ever. And uh, then uh, most Christians are also, well, probably half are Catholic to these days, about a billion non-Catholics, a billion Catholics. The Catholics also have purgatory in between, uh, which is where most people go, because you're not usually good enough to get into heaven or quite bad enough to get into hell. So you go into this temporary hell, where you're uh, burned in a fire and your sins are purged. That's purgatory. And then eventually you go to heaven. Uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting idea. Uh, but out of all of these ideas here, and this isn't all the ideas on the table, I just wanted to show you six big ones, right? Uh, ancient uh, mostly, but also some modern. Nobody has the gall in these beliefs here. Nobody has the gall to believe that a dead, rotted corpse would be able to live again. That's just too much. That's just, that's weird. That's out there. Except those who believe in the Bible. Except for those who believe in the Bible. Nobody's got the gall to believe that a rotted corpse, buried, rotted, nothing left but the bones, corpse, that can't live. Come on. There must be some other part of you that lives on. and it, 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 must be, it must be a different way. That can't, come on, everybody knows dead people can't live. That's not what this book says. This book says, oh, yes, they can. Oh, yes, they can. The God who made you in the beginning can remake you in the end. He can bring you back to life. And you know what? We don't have to guess about this. Look at, uh, look at Luke 24, verse 36. As they, were, as they were talking about these things, this is one of the appearances of Jesus. As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. So that's like that, you know, angels appear, people appear. Peace to you, because everyone's freaked out. 
except for Mary Magdalene. All right, verse 37. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. Even the disciples, they're like, oh, it's got to be a spirit. It's a, a ghost or something. I don't know what this is. They are the worst believers. That's, why, that's one of the reasons why I know it's true. Because they would make themselves look better if they were making it up, right? <laughs> Verse 38, and he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet. Jesus like, I thought you guys would be happy to see me. <laughs> They're all like, ah! <laughs> What's that? Jesus like, guys, hello. See, look at my hands, look at my feet, it's me. Touch me and see, verse 39, touch me and see, Jesus says to them. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? Come on, guys, let's have lunch. They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate before them. And he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Come back next week if you want to know what that is. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning in Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. So Jesus appears to them. They don't believe it. He says, hey, guys, look, it's me. Look, look at my hands. Look at my feet. They, they, they still don't believe. He says, all right, come here. Come here. Come here. Touch me. Touch me. All right. All right. Do you believe it's me? And they're like, no. Nah. All right. Do you have any food? Do you have any food? Do you have any food? All right. Let's uh, got some fish over here. All right. Let me eat the fish because it's a superhuman thing to do, right? It's a normal human thing to do to eat fish, right? <laughs> Unless you don't like fish, but like if it's a normal thing to do to eat. And finally, they believe. And he says to them, guys, guys, this was in the scriptures. This was in the scriptures before. It's one of the reasons why we're a Bible based church, because we don't want Jesus on the last day. You're standing before him and he says, guys, it's in the scriptures. Do you want him to say that to you? No, no, let's get in the scriptures now. And see what he says. It's in the scriptures. This was, um, th I just love this. I mean, this is, this is a dead Jesus. You know, he was crucified. He was stabbed with the spear. He was buried for days. His corpse lay there in the cold tomb, rotting. And now he's a living, he's the same person. He's not a clone Jesus and his body's still there, but he's got a new body. No, 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 no. This is that Jesus, but he's got some upgrades. He's got some upgrades, which is pretty cool, right? He's got some upgrades because it's like the same one made new. And how all that works, you know, the philosophers will have to figure that out. But that it works is where I stake my faith, that God will see us through death to the moment of resurrection itself. And this, for them, was so weird because their belief about resurrection, if you read the Old Testament, their belief about resurrection was that it was something that would happen at the end of time to all of God's people. What is he doing up early? <laughs> right? You remember uh, uh, another Mary, or maybe the same Mary? I don't know. There's a lot of Marys in the Bible. They're all named after uh, Moses' sister, I believe, uh, Miriam. Anyhow, side point. She said to Jesus when Lazarus died, I know I will see him again in the resurrection. Remember that? Because, you know, that was their belief. I know, okay, we have to wait for the resurrection to happen. It's not when you die. It's when Jesus comes back. That's when the resurrection happens. She says, I know I'll see him again in the resurrection. So, you know, that's the same belief that these people have. Jesus didn't sin. He's a righteous man. You know, maybe he's not the Messiah, but he's at least a prophet. And we'll see him again at the resurrection. And then he's standing in front of your face like. And Jesus, remember what he said to her in John 11? He said, I am the resurrection and the life. You remember that? I am the resurrection. And so Jesus rises from the dead before everyone else. Every other time somebody stands up on the century before Christ and the century after Christ and gets some sort of messianic movement going, the Romans kill them. Every time. And you know what their followers do? They go home. 
You know, if, if, you're, if, you're, if you're a prophetic leader, you're a charismatic Messiah figure who gets killed by the Romans, it's time to go home. It's time to go home. You go back to work. You say sorry to everyone you ditched, right? You're like, I was wrong. And they're like, let me hear you say that again. I was wrong, right? I mean, that's what you do when your Messiah dies. You don't make up a story about how he's alive again. That's weird. There's no other movement that does this in that whole period that we call the Second Temple period, except for the Christians. It's almost like they saw Jesus. <laughs> Look, if you've got a hole in history, the shape and size of a resurrection, I would suggest that the best explanation is that there was a resurrection because it's really hard to explain the Christians without it. You know, we're not like an LSD cult where we're all like out having visions, right? I mean, does that seem to you the kind of books that they would write? The New Testament, if they were into shrooms? I mean, look at the New Testament. They talk about being honest, loving one another. Well, maybe the loving one another would, would work with the shrooms in the hippie culture, right? But I mean, the, the kinds of stuff that they teach is not like that. It doesn't fit at all. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I want to close there. So this, this is really the strength of my second point, which is that Jesus' resurrection sets the standard. When Mary Magdalene first saw Jesus, she heard him say one word. What was it? Mary. 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 And she said, Rabboni. And then he, he said to her, stop clinging to me, for I have what? Not yet ascended. Whoa! What do you mean you've not yet ascended? Now look, if Jesus doesn't get to go to heaven when he dies, who are you? <laughs> who am I? You think I'm going to go to heaven when I die? Jesus did not yet ascend. He was dead, and he, he, and he came back to life, and he said to her, I have not yet ascended to my Father, but go tell the disciples, I am going to ascend to my Father and, and your Father, to my God and to your God. Look, if Jesus didn't get into heaven when he died, you're not going to heaven when you die. That's okay, though. That's okay, though. God, I told you, God's going to figure it out, what happens in the intermediate state. But we know that the scriptures call it sleep. Amen. And if you're awake, when you're, then you're not asleep. Right? So whatever sleep means, it can't mean you're awake. So you're asleep, you're out of it. But the great thing about being asleep is that you have no idea what's going on. So it's like time travel. You die, pff, Jesus comes back. How's that for good news? Huh? <laughs> All right, 1 Corinthians 15. I got ahead of myself. The scripture is going to say this, but I got, I got excited. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Look, are you in Christ? Then you'll be made alive. If you're not in Christ, come to Jesus. He's worthy of your heart. He's worthy of your heart. Um, but if you are in Christ, you'll be made alive. Verse 23. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom of God, or the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and authority and power. The timing is when he returns. We know from Philippians 3.21 that he's going to transform our bodies to be like his glorious body. Jesus is the prototype. His resurrection sets the example for your resurrection. Do you see how that works? And it happens when he comes. One more scripture to close out. Verse 51. Verse 51, one of the great passages of all resurrection teaching in all the Bible. 1 Corinthians 15, 51, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, that means die, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on imperishable. And this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on the immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. I love verse 55. It's a taunt. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? That's our hope. That's our hope. That's our living hope. And so the question I have for you is, do you have 
resurrection faith? Do you have faith in Christ's resurrection? And if so, then you should have faith in your future resurrection, so long as you follow Him, so long as you stay faithful. So we've seen this happen. Death is defeated. This isn't all there is. We have living hope. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the glorious good news that your son died for our sins, that you raised him from the dead. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> that you raised him from the dead, that he will return one day to make everything wrong with the world right in the kingdom of God. We ask that you would open our hearts to receive your son and to follow him more closely each day. We pray for your help in this because we can't do it alone. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.